if I didn't love America so much, I'd move to Australia. I mean, I'm really taken with the country, its people, their cultural traditions, and how, how similar, in some senses, their relationship with the environment and their history in the environment is similar to that of the American West. And in fact, my travels between the United States and Australia, Alaska, and Chile have led me to define a kind of greater West that circles around the Pacific Basin that goes down from Alaska down to the tip of, of, of Chile to the tip of South America and across to, across to Australia. Uh, there's so many similarities, some of which have to do with resources extraction, indigenous peoples, arid lands, and so forth. So. Um, the result of my being so smitten with the continent uh, and going there so often is I've had the opportunity to work with some extraordinary people, artists and scientists uh, in Australia. When I was talking about Will Steffen, for instance, and his collaboration with Paul Kreutzen, talking about the Anthropocene, Will is a major climate scientist who works in Australia. Um, all of the projects you're going to hear from today, all of the people you're going to hear from have archives flowing into the Manor Museum of Art. And I'll say something more about that in, in just a second. But it's a very deep relationship between this institution and the continent of Australia. Kind of fun to have a relationship with the continent, isn't it? Yeah. Australia, as a continent, is the hottest, flattest, and driest one of the, the continents, the seven continents. It has perhaps the oldest exposed geology on the face of the planet, 3.6 billion years old. It's also the continent with the oldest fossils that are exposed, maybe 3.4 billion years old. 3.4 billion years old, most of the life of the planet. And it's had people modifying its environment, modifying its surface uh, for at least, we think, 50,000 years. And you notice the fact that I keep using qualifiers, maybe, perhaps, sort of, we think. That's because you get into deep time and things get a little strange, a little uncertain. We're not. You know, we're still trying to understand, do we have this chronology right? Is our dating method here right? Do we need another kind of dating method? You get into the deep past, things get pretty interesting. So we're going from 10,000 years in the future with Long Now Foundation <clears throat> to around 50,000 years in the past with Australia. Understanding, uh, much less working in such a context as these people do, uh, is both daunting and exhilarating. A person who has worked there uh, is Dr. Stephen Wells, who is the president of the Desert Research Institute. He's himself a geologist. Uh, he's the past president of the Geological Society of America, which is a high distinction. Um, and he's done research in Australia. He's going to actually introduce, introduce um, our, our, our panelists in just a moment. Uh, before he does, then I'd like to talk just a second about a couple of the archive projects uh, that we are collecting here um, at the museum. Mandy Martin, who's going to be speaking this morning, uh, who's, I think, the greatest romantic sublime painter on the face of the planet, has been putting together these, it's not a small statement, has been uh, putting together these expeditions of scientists and artists um, for years in Australia. Um, and we already have one archive from one uh, expedition that she led called Desert Channels. You'll see the book is for sale out in the, in the bookstore. Uh, and it's a marvelously thorough archive. And she, when she was designing the next project that's coming up that John Carty, who's one another collaborator, is going to talk about, um, that project was designed in part to generate an archive for us. So we're going to, we need maps and correspondence and all these wonderful things. Something extraordinary happened that John will describe um, in this project. It involves a generation of actual artworks in Australia by indigenous peoples and white artists collaborating. Um, and all of that work will actually, we hope, be coming to the museum in 2014. 2013, and then probably for exhibition in 2014. That's an extraordinary thing for a, any museum in America to do. There are very, there's one major collection of Aboriginal Australian art in America, uh, in Virginia. Uh, there are little smatterings of, of Aboriginal art throughout the country, but for a, a museum in America to be involved uh, with an indigenous uh, new art center in Australia is extraordinary, much less a museum of our size. Well, as I stated earlier, uh, Steve Wells is a geologist. He's been a professor of geology. He's been chairman of the geology department at the University of New Mexico, another, another Albuquerque-Santa Fe connection. And since 1999, he's been the leader of DRI, one of the world's premier environmental research organizations in the world. Um, and in fact, it's in part because of the Literature and Environment Program at the University of Nevada, Reno, and DRI that we have an art and environment center at the museum, because we knew we needed partners, and they were already there. Um, in 2008, uh, the English artist Chris Drury was brought here by Ann Wolfe, uh, and they, uh, he worked with DRI scientists um, doing projects that involve things like the Nevada test site as part of a show that was up actually during the last conference. So DRI has been a very, very uh, strong partner for us 
for a while now. Um, when you go look at the Harrison Show and you see the map that's on the floor and you see the video animations, that's, that's the, dig, uh, the digital visualization people at DRI working with us to make that happen. So with that, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to welcome Steve Wells. He's also an advisor to the Center for Art and Environment. Please notice the man's tie. <laughs> It's Australian art. So, well, thank you, uh, uh, Bill, and uh, the Nevada Museum of Art. It's quite an honor to have a, a prestigious scientific institution also reaching out and branching into uh, different areas. And one of the uh, one of the first things I did when I became president was uh, bring an art show up to DRI and put it in the hallways. So I've always had this this interest in. Uh, expanding our capability. Uh, Bill asked me to say just a couple words about DRI and I don't want to take too much time but I, I'll bring it back to actually the the whole purpose of the center and and a lot of the focus of this museum. DRI uh, is your environmental research institution. It's Nevada's. We've been around 52 years. We have 580 employees uh, primarily located here in Reno and in Las Vegas. Uh, we have about uh, 300 projects going on uh, any given time on every continent on the earth. And uh, our research uh, has a lot of interesting aspects. So it spans from bringing water resources here to the desert parched uh, areas of Nevada to sustainable water supplies for the uh, unfortunate rural communities of West Africa. So there's, there's a relationship there. We study the air pollution in Las Vegas created by all the traffic and then we turn around and we look at the impact of air pollution on the 2,000 year old terracotta soldiers of uh, Xi'an, of Emperor Chen's in China and work on preserving those. We've looked at the impact of human pollution and how it's recorded in the layers of ice in the, in the Greenland and what that means in terms of lead concentrations all the way to the impact of nuclear detonations here in Nevada. We bombed ourselves 980 times and yet we have a history there. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, we have done that and there is a remarkable Cold War archaeology that we've been involved with. So in many ways the research we do at DRI is on altered and altering landscapes. So it fits in very clearly with the theme that we have here and we're uh, very honored to be a partner. Let me start off by saying that yesterday the Harrison said something I thought was fairly profound and they said that artists start without knowing the end. Well, earth scientists actually start at the end and then try to learn the beginning. <laughs> and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce a very prominent earth scientist from Australia who I've had the privilege of uh, working with uh, and being with on field trips in the outback. He is uh, Gerald Nansen. He reserved his, he uh, got his PhD from Simon Fraser University in British Columbia and has taught at Wollongong University since 1977, just south of Sydney, right on the coast. He has published 80 papers on a variety of areas that deal with things that we were hearing about today, erosion, flood risk, river management, rehabilitation of rivers, how climate affects floods, but he's really known for how rivers take shape and I think that's very interesting given the fact that we've heard a lot about the shapes uh, from a variety of people this morning. And then he's moved into the history of rivers, dunes and lakes and trying to find their origins as well. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Gerald Nansen. Gerald? Right, if we could start with the, which button do I push? I'll just make a few introductory remarks. Uh, first, what a privilege it is to be asked to a meeting of this uh, type. Uh, I, I was uh, amazed really to be asked to come and speak here uh, as a scientist. Um, but I would say that uh, a number of things uh, about being a scientist and studying rivers is that, uh, and coming to a museum of art is that there's nothing mutually exclusive in all that. Um, we as scientists, when we go into the Australian outback, I think we go in, uh, of course, with a, uh, with a set of scientific spectacles, but it is something of a spiritual experience as well. You can't go into the Australian outback and, and, uh, and see it in, in its 
remarkable uh, scientific splendour without having a true sense of awe and wonder. I was interested to hear Bill say that he would be tempted almost to move to Australia uh, if he didn't love America quite as much as he does. And I'm just wondering what little bit we can do in Australia, Bill, to make you love it that little bit more <laughs> and, and bring you, to, bring you to, uh, to Australia. Because I too am not an Australian by, by birth. I was born in New Zealand, a couple of small islands off to the right-hand side of Australia. <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't move to Australia until I was 30. And uh, having worked there, I too have very much fallen in love with the continent and I love to do research there. And I'd love to spend two hours telling you about the research that I do, but I've been told I've got seven minutes. So <laughs> I will move on with, with my talk. Um, it is a hot, uh, it is a flat, and it's a very dry continent. I would correct one slight impression. It's not the driest continent on the planet. That distinction goes to Antarctica. But it is nevertheless very hot uh, and very flat and very dry. And I'm going to highlight uh, those aspects for you. Um, the subtitle, really, of my talk could be by the Australian poet, Dorothea McKellar, who, uh, who, made those, uh, who wrote those wonderful lines, I love a sunburned country, and then lower in the poem of droughts and flooding rains. And of course, we are a continent of that. Uh, many of you will, will see on the nightly news uh, every year or so that Australia is either having bushfires or it's having floods. And that's really what does make up our continent. Uh, the, the excitement of it, if you like, we never quite know what's going to happen next. Um, a rather boring picture of Australia, but nevertheless one that does show the nature of the continent. Uh, there's nothing there that's much higher than about a thousand metres. Uh, much of the continent is flat, it's extremely old. It's a clapped out old continent really. It's been around for a very long time. Uh, there's lots of it that is very weathered and worn, and, uh, and that's what you're looking at. It's, it's sometimes called the red continent, because as a result of its age, the long period that it's been oxidised and weathered, uh, its soils have turned to a sort of rusty red colour. Our drainage basins are very different to those that you have here. You have a high range of mountains which feeds uh, rivers like the Mississippi uh, with abundant amount, amounts of water. We have a very low gradient continent. There are our two largest drainage basins, Lake Eyre Basin and uh, the Murray-Darling Basin. You've probably heard certainly of the, last of those, the latter of those. Um, they're both about a million square kilometres. Uh, one of them drains to the sea, the Murray-Darling Basin. Uh, the other one uh, never makes it to the sea, it drains into the interior of the continent. And in fact, it was a region which led to an enormous myth in Australia, uh, a great search for this mythical inland sea that must occur in the centre of this continent. Uh, what else could be there? The rivers didn't seem, they seemed to be running somewhere. Uh, where, where were they running? They must be running to a sea. Well, uh, many explorers lost their lives looking for that inland sea and all that was there was this uh, salt pan called Lake Eyre um, and these low gradient rivers which periodically flooded and, and fed water to, to this um, dry heart, which one early explorer referred to as the dead heart of Australia. I think that's a great misnomer. It's a living place, it's an exciting place. Sure, it goes through cycles and there are times when it looks dead but it always springs to life again. It's a continent which is fed by a large variety of weather systems and I've become very interested lately in not just studying the rivers but studying where the water in Australia comes from. Of course we have a monsoon in the north, uh, the, the Asian monsoon which switches back and forth between China and Indonesia and down in, into Australia. We have the trade winds which sweep across the Pacific Ocean. We have the strong westerlies that come up from Antarctica and across from Africa. Uh, and we have this interesting phenomenon which has only just been researched recently called the Indian Ocean Dipole, somewhat like Enso or La Nina, El Nino, that cycle that's so characteristic of the Pacific Ocean. There is another cycle that operates in the Indian Ocean and feeds water to this continent. This is what these things look like in reality in a satellite map. There's the monsoon, uh, a huge circular storm of water being fed into the continent uh, at isolated uh, times. 
uh, and feeding the river systems, the easterly troughs which tra uh, travel down the east coast of Australia, and in fact you may have heard on the news this year a uh, considerable loss of life near, near Brisbane as a result of one of these very active easterly troughs which brought very sudden rainfall uh, to that part of the world. And then the, the steady westerlies that come across the southern ocean and uh, the, just as the westerlies that feed uh, your northwest coast and the west coast of uh, Europe, we have these uh, westerly fronts that come across the southern ocean and feed that part of our continent. I, I shouldn't really come to a conference of, uh, of artists and feed you with facts and figures, but <laughs> I, I couldn't help just one. You'll allow me just one, uh, one table because it illustrates a very interesting distinction between your continent and mine. Um, the Australian continent uh, has a precipitation there. This is a fairly short record of precipitation, but over those two years of 2004-05, uh, uh, 364 millimetres of rainfall on average over the continent. And uh, when you look at how much evaporates, how much runs off, how much goes into the groundwater, which we tend to forget, but the importance, of course, of feeding our groundwater aquifers, uh, those are the numbers in gigalitres uh, on the right-hand side. And the ratio of what runs off our continent uh, as runoff, the ratio of that to precipitation is 0.08, or if you like, 8 0.6% of the water that comes onto the continent runs off in the river. So quite a small fraction. And look at the US below. Uh, don't worry too much about the numbers, but the bottom ratio there, 26% of your water uh, enters your river systems and helps to create your rivers. So Australian rivers are made out of only 8% or 8 to 9% of the rainfall. Uh, US rivers are made out of more than a quarter of the water that lands on your continent uh, runs down your river systems to form the rivers. So what is Australia's climate? Well we know it's hot and dry. Uh, it actually has a mean annual rainfall, not counting those, just those two years. If you look at the long term record of about 450 millimetres across the whole continent. So that's the water input. Um, it has an enormous evaporation. If you go to the last figure there, uh, a large part of the continent has an evaporation rate of 3,500 millimetres. Now that's a, if you take the driest part of the continent where they get about 100 millimetres of rainfall, uh, quite large areas of the continent have an evaporation rate or an, an amount of evaporation which is 35 times the amount of water that rains onto the continent. So you can see that that will have a big impact on that continent. And I've shown you a couple of slides there. One on the right hand side is, a, is an aerial view. The one on the left is a ground view. Much of the continent is dune covered. I've said that much of the continent is flat. It is the lowest continent on the planet. It only has an average elevation of about 340 metres. Europe, oddly enough, is the next lowest continent. Um, and uh, it has uh, an elevation of somewhere about 500 metres, average elevation. So we're distinctly the lowest continent and we're a very flat continent and that gives our rivers a particular characteristic. Our rivers drain across very low gradient floodplains. Here's a view of uh, Cooper Creek. Uh, it's certainly, uh, it, it's an odd creek because two very large rivers come together in Queensland uh, to form Cooper Creek. It's probably the only place in the world where two rivers join to form a creek. <laughs> gets to 60 kilometres wide and there's a view of that location on Cooper Creek. Mostly it's dry, that left hand figure uh, with, a, with a water hole, a sinuous water hole passing through it. Uh, but in La Nina years, those odd wet years that we get in Australia, we can have 60 kilometres of water from one side of that floodplain to the other. As geomorphologists we don't just study the sediments and the rivers and the hydraulics of the rivers. We're very aware of the enormous role that vegetation plays and I was intrigued with this morning's talks on the importance and rehabilitating sites, the importance that was given to the role of vegetation. Australia's known about the role of vegetation for hundreds of millions of years. Our plants have evolved, they've co-evolved with the rivers. If you look at those rivers there, they seem to have rows of trees growing down them. And that's exactly what they are. They're, they're lines of trees which grow down these rivers. Uh, and those trees will only be found along those river systems. They have co-evolved with the rivers. And they are distinctive 
to, to the continent. The continent was isolated when it broke away from Gondwana land 45 million years ago and it had no trees like this and as it moved northward it got drier and drier as it moved into what's called the horse latitudes and these plants co-evolved and they formed a unique variety of flora which exists along the rivers and explains a lot of the geomorphology. A lot of the characteristics of our rivers are explained by that single phenomenon of these plants which have evolved along with the rivers. The other characteristic of our continent is it's made up of very hard and, and resistant rocks. And there are one or two more numbers there just to illustrate. Our rivers can cut quite profoundly back into the landscape. They can move at two and a half kilometres per million years. Now, in geological rates, that's very fast. But the rate of vertical reduction of the landscape is no more than the height of me, really, in about a million years. So while our rivers cut back into the continent, the, the landscape is actually eroding extremely slowly. And the sides of those valleys move back only about that far per million years. So we're dealing with a continent which is evolving incredibly slowly. Another intriguing characteristic of our continent is the rate at which chemical processes are occurring, particularly in the north. For chemical processes to operate rapidly, you need really two things, well three things. You need some chemistry, which we do provide in the form of weathering rocks and, and some volcanic rocks. You need some high temperatures, which we're able to provide in the north, and you need water. And we are able to provide that in the north too. And here are some rivers. Now, most people would think of rivers as where you go with a bucket and spade and you dig into sandbars and you, you imagine the river banks are weak and they fall down fairly easily. But in the north of Australia, a lot of the rivers are so chemically affected by these high temperatures and reactive rocks and the moisture that's available in the form of the monsoon that the soft sediments turn to rock very quickly. So some of these rocks are only a few thousand years old. So you could imagine the Mississippi if it had the task of trying to rework its sediment as it moved back and forth across the Mississippi plain. If, if those rocks were suddenly converted, if those sediments were suddenly converted into rock. And that's what we've got here. So we've got waterfalls and we've got rapids which have formed very rapidly along some of our rivers and explain some of the unique characteristics we have. As I get towards the end here, just to identify another intriguing characteristic of our rivers is because they're low gradient, because the continent is old, because the sediments are very well weathered, we have a lot of fine silty sediment. And those fine silty sediments, as I say in my last statement up there, the Australian rivers connive to keep the, the sediment loads low. And how do they do that? They take these fine sediments and they aggregate them. They don't move them as fine, silty sediments which are easily moved. Those sediments become aggregated into sand-sized particles which are much more difficult to move. And those pictures there on the right show you some ripples and some, that's a, a thin section through a microscope, those black blobs are aggregates of mud. And so across this low gradient continent you don't get the sediment moving rapidly, as rapidly as one might expect. Uh, because, as we've discovered recently through quite a, a detailed series of scientific studies, we can show that these aggregates, uh, the, the muds clump together. And the final characteristic of our rivers is that they interact with these dunes. I showed you dunes in the first slide. Well, our rivers are often wandering through dune fields. That's a satellite image on the bottom right-hand side there, and it's showing Cooper Creek as it comes out from a confined zone, the Inaminka Dome, and it's interacting with the dune fields of the Streslecki Desert. And so the sand goes from the rivers to the dunes. It's blown out of the rivers in, in dry periods and into the dunes, and then the rivers rediscover it and put it back into the rivers. And so there's this constant interchange, really, between the, uh, the aeolian processes, the wind-blown processes that, that create uh, land, a particular landscape, and the fluvial processes, the ones that control the rivers. Thank you very much. I've had the pleasure of waking up one morning and finding one of those rivers has suddenly come up about a, a meter and a half. <laughs> and uh, we took about an extra day to get out of that. And that wasn't long enough, I can tell you. It took us a day just to go a, a few miles by digging out of mud. So thank you very much, Gerald. One of Australia's preeminent uh, painters, Mandy Martin, has been a fellow and a lecturer at the School of Art 
at the Australian National University, where she remains an adjunct professor at the ANU Finner School of Environment and Society. She has numerous exhibitions in Australia, France, Germany, Japan, Taiwan, Italy, and the US. Her works reside in many public and private collections, including the National Gallery of Australia, the Guggenheim Museum, and the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art. Her publications include, and they're, they're out here, uh, books uh, that are entitled Inflows, The Channel Country, Strata, Deserts, Past, Present, and Future, a favorite of mine, and the recent Desert Channels, The, <coughs> the Impulse to Conserve. It's my pleasure to introduce Mandy Martin. Mandy. There's an image before that one. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen, and um, thank you, Bill, and the Centre for Art and Environment for asking me to this auspicious conference, fantastic conference, actually. Um, we're having a bit too uh, of a good time, really. <laughs> in, in Australia, it's the custom um, at public events like this to do what's called a welcome to country, um, which is the way of acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land. And with the f help of um, Laurie from uh, Santa Fe, um, I've been told that the Shoshone, the Washo, and the Paiute people um, uh, own, are the traditional owners of this country we're gathered on today, and I'd like to acknowledge that. I'm really pleased that Gerald spoke before me because <laughs> it's a very good lead into navigating the waters um, in Australia. <laughs> so, so this stranded boat um, is actually on the, um, that 60 uh, kilometre floodplain that you just saw of Cooper Creek. And in the boat with me are a bunch of scientists and my husband Guy Fitzharding, who's up the back there, who's a, an anthropologist, um, but also a grazier. And um, we've worked together on all of our environmental projects, basically. In fact, I employed him as an environmental consultant originally for a whole thousand dollars. And the first bit of advice he gave me was come and live with me, so. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll talk briefly about the Desert Channels project, um, the Impulse to Conserve. It was an interdisciplinary project, um, an environmental art project, which culminated in a book, a website, and an exhibition. Uh, it included um, 46 contributors in the end, it's sort of a rolling uh, road show, really, and we had um, uh, 16 authors in the book. Um, the book was actually published by Australia's top scientific publishers. I felt that was quite a coup to be published by um, CSIRO Australia, and in fact they're doing our next book also, which John Carty will talk about afterwards. I've worked in the uh, channel country of, of Australia in um, South East Queensland since 2001 on a series of environmental projects. And my particular focus um, has been on the bioregion edging onto the Simpson Desert, which is along the left-hand side of this map, and in fact um, is north of the Streslecki Desert. <laughs> Yeah, so this is actually right on the edge of Cooper's Creek. That's the mayor sitting on the left having a beer there with um, his cousin who drives the grader. <laughs> there are only 450 people in the vast shire of, um, uh, of um, around Cooper's Creek, Windora. Um, so the book's structured about around the wet and dry cycles of arid Australia. The, um, the book's a horizontal landscape, four by four um, format, and all of the images are in sets of four. The book's divided into four um, and reflects the seasons um, within the, the channel country. So the, the, uh, the books, uh, the, part of the parts of the book are place, um, landscape, biodiversity, and livelihood. And each section of the book is marked by four suites of my landscape studies. Um, I'm not talking about my sort of major studio work practice today. What I'm talking about are the sort of, the sort of virtual drawings I do in the landscape um, when, um, you know, I'm working 
I'm working in the field. And so here you can see some of the other members of the team. Um, Libby Robin on the left in the foreground um, is an environmental historian. And then next to her, Tom Griffiths, who's a um, historian and writer. It's written, um, like Bill, about Antarctica. And um, then Steve Morton, who's a arid zone ecologist, Guy Fitzharding in the blue shirt. And then um, the the property manager um, wearing the veil there, she knew how bad the flies were. That was an exceptionally bad year, that one. Sorry, I'll go back. Um, so each study, each landscape study is about 24 inches square to go um, into your measurements. Um, so, and they're in sets of four, so that makes, um, that's a metre in our terms. Um, and I, I use found pigments, so that red sand is actually red sand. Um, I use a lot of ochres, red ochres, and um, if I need a white and I haven't got the right white available to me, I might use a bit of ceramics, titanium white. Um, and the deep um, purple colour I use is actually hematite from Mount Newman. It's um, just another oxide. Um, this is a little bit out of sequence, my images here. So um, this is interesting, what's happening here. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, we'll just go back here. Um, sorry, something's happened with the sequence. Um, so here's some other members of the team working in the field um, and discussing and, and looking um, at the project um, material. In the background there on the top left, um, this is for... Um, is uh, Richard Nelson, who um, a lot of you will know from Alaska and actually did a sound um, piece for us in the back of the, um, the book, a sound installation of the Simpson Desert. He was really suffering with the heat. It was incredible for him coming from Alaska. <laughs> um, we, I feel it's really important with any environmental art project we do is to take it back to the people who have been part of the project, the graziers and the local ecologists and the property managers. And um, I don't know why it keeps jumping like that. Is it on a timer or something? Or, um, so we, we actually um, uh, launched the book last year, last September, at the Stockman's Hall of Fame. Uh, <laughs> which and all of the local um, crowd came, a lot of media, and um, it was a really big social gathering for, for Longreach, um, which is really in the centre of Australia. We also did a launch at, um, uh, on the Darling River in Burke at um, an environmental conference that was on there. Um, as their name implies, desert channels usually are precisely that, um, they're dry water courses. And, um, and the watercourses I've painted were dry or drying up until the season of 2009 when both Etherbooker Springs, after its restoration by Bush Heritage Australia and Pultra Waterhole, um, also on Etherbooker Reserve, were looking wonderful. And Libby Robin, co-editor and environmental historian I mentioned, swam up and down this waterhole for about an hour and a half while I um, was painting, having sort of close encounters with brogues flying overhead and some of the seven species of native fish in the, in the, um, in the waterhole. Fortunately, we were able to include plenty of wet images in the book, um, and these sort of fairly classic aerial photos were taken by a pilot and grazier who was part of the project, um, and they show just how amazing the transformation of um, the land by that water has been in the last, particularly in the last few years. The, these sort of aerial images have really entered the psyche of Australians in recent years because we've had a succession of really um, big and dramatic floods. The book also tries to capture some of the many individual aesthetics, including the local aesthetics of the desert channels. Um, and <laughs> for example, this image here by local grazier um, Simon Campbell um, actually became a water installation um, over January 2009 after he'd had a foot of rain. <laughs> and, he, and Simon keeps sending me the hundreds and hundreds of photos. He's sort of very visual, um, even though he's a grazier. Uh, the book's also a celebration of what people in the region value visually about their place um, and what visitors might expect, you know, tourists and visitors might expect when they go and visit. 
Uh, the voice and presence of the traditional owners of the desert channels is present throughout the book. And the welcome for country at the um, Stockman's Hall of Fame was performed by David Thompson, um, who's an Inangai man. And <laughs> he did a, a full PowerPoint presentation for his welcome to country and gave us the full black armband history of massacres and so on in the desert channel. So it was very confronting for some of the graziers who were there. <laughs> um, the, other, the other major aesthetic contribution to the book are the sculptural works by Faye Alexander. Um, and, they, and these are constructed from wire and found objects which she um, collects from rubbish dumps and so on on the properties we were working. So um, you can see the size of these here. Um, there she is working on a piece covered in her fly veil. Um, here's Tom Griffiths discussing um, Faye's work. I work on an ironing board, as you can see, which causes great hilarity if anyone comes across me out there in the middle of the desert. Perfect height and very flexible. Yeah. And <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so Faye, Faye and I, you know, like many artists here, have worked long and hard on developing a desert aesthetic. And I talk about mine quite extensively in the book. So although, although I'd like to talk about that, I really haven't got the time today. Um, but what's so pleasing is to celebrate the large scale aesthetic of, <laughs> this is on a timer, I think, the large scale aesthetic of, um, uh, of scientists and historians and the other desert channelers who were constantly capturing sort of the ultimate windmill at sunset or reptile tracks. Richard Nelson's a great photographer too. He's a really great photographer, lovely eye. So this little this sequence of um, tracks in the red sand dunes were all Richard's photos. Um, I think sometimes it takes someone who's come from outside to see things that maybe to us are so familiar, you just walk right past and think, oh yeah, tracks, you know. So whereas Richard sees all of that. My desert um, channels landscape studies were all painted on location at Ethbooker and Craven's Peak, as I mentioned, and they, they were two former pastoral properties. And they're now conserved by Bush Heritage Australia, and that has um, alliances with Nature Conservancy here in the United States. Um, and they're, they're managed as conservation reserves. Um, they're located in the simpson Streslecki Desert Bioregion of Desert Channels, Queensland, and co-editor um, distinguished um, uh, uh, arid zone ecologist Chris Dickman um, was the other editor um, of the Desert Channels book and he's been studying um, the ecology of this area on, on these two properties in particular for the last 20 years and they go out there every four times a year with students and um, volunteers and um, collect data on the reptiles and the marsupials and um, bats and so on. Aesthetic evaluation demands a visual vocabulary with which to assess the landscape. And I see this process as being similar to collecting scientific data almost. It's an intensive process based on sampling and resampling and reliant on a consistent methodology or approach and is susceptible to interference from many variables. Artists open a path for viewers to see the visually valuable or special features of a landscape which is no news to most of you here, but um, you know, often people say, well, how does um, aesthetic evaluation work as an environmental tool? Um, and I often talk to scientific audiences, so um, being able to talk about methodology is actually quite important. Each reading informs the next. So by working with ecologists, we lost the last slide, sorry doesn't matter. Um, so each reading informs the next. So work, by working with ecologists, pastoralists, philanthropists, historians, anthropologists and others with viewpoints on the landscape, the aesthetic view of landscape is integrated into a larger project that can value and perhaps conserve landscape in more ways. Thanks very much. The susceptibility to intrusion was illustrated by the timer that was on the uh, computer, so 
But very well done. Thank you very much, Mandy. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce John Carty, who is an anthropologist and curator who works with Aborigine artists throughout the Western Desert, the Pilbara and, Kil and uh, Kimberley regions of Australia. He writes broadly about uh, Australian Aboriginal art and the notions of human environment relationships that the painters explore in their work. He's the curator of the uh, Yawara Kuju, the Canning Stock Route, an exhibition of contemporary Aborigine art and oral history. Uh, I have that book in my backpack. I'm going to get him to sign that. It's phenomenal. Uh, based on the um, Research School of Humanities at the Australian National University, he's re recently finished his PhD on creation of country and the Bago art of the uh, Western Desert. Cardi will be a research fellow, or a, I guess presently is here, from 2010 to 12 at the Center of Art and Environment, and uh, was recently named fellow of the British Museum. So it's a real pleasure to bring John. John, please. I didn't realize we were presenting in IMAX, so I, I apologize <laughs> in advance if some of the images aren't quite up to scratch. Um, the story of, of water, as you're probably starting to guess this morning, is the story of Australia. The Aboriginal songlines that map the totemic geography of our continent follow the logic of water, just as surely as the pattern of colonial settlement was corralled by its perceived absence. Baraku, or Lake Gregory as it came to be known by settlers, is an environment of profound scientific, historic and cultural significance. A site where this story is sedimented through time and is being unearthed today in challenging and sometimes revelatory ways. This great uh, desert lake is home to Aboriginal people, the Walmajari, the surrounding fertile country providing them with an abundant source of plant and animal life for millennia. At the turn of the 20th century, this remarkable desert ecosystem also attracted pastoralists and a cattle industry that would impact the region deeply. Missionaries followed in the 1940s, adding another layer to the complex history of colonisation and Aboriginal displacement that characterised our shared history. In recent decades, the Walmajari have returned from the stations and the mission to live on their own lake country, to preserve its values and therein their identity and a way of life that they want to pass on to their children. This is the lake. Um, I'll come back to this image a little later. Um, here, this is actually the community of Mullen, where about 150 people live today. And in the background, you can see the lake. Um, so this life plays out today around one of Australia's most important inland wetlands, the extraordinary bird life and biodiversity of which is now being pressured by the impacts of introduced species of flora and fauna like cattle and horses. For these reasons, among others, it has been registered as an Indigenous Protected Area, an IPA, a designation through which the government supports traditional owners with funding, training and the science necessary to take care of their own country. Um, these are the Baraku Rangers. Um, you don't mess with the Baraku Rangers. Um, but they're a wonderful group of, of young Aboriginal blokes. Baraku is an ecological, a historical and an epistemological frontier. It's not only a place where waters flow into the desert, but where people follow. And therefore where human and environmental understandings and values conflict and converge. The Baraku project, a bit about which I'll talk briefly today, um, is a collaborative, interdisciplinary and, and most importantly a cross-cultural uh, attempt to come to terms with such a place um, and with its place in the much broader story that we all seem to be scratching at um, here. Baraku is part of a remnant paleo system that once formed a vast ancient river flowing westwards into the Indian Ocean. Uh, here you see the lake as it was about 250,000 years ago with its current dimensions, about 100,000 hectares in blue. The topography of these concentric shorelines is a deep time register of the impact of ice ages and monsoons. The lakes act as epic rain gauges. They expand during wet periods in history and contract, even disappearing during dry times. For these reasons, the lake is key to understanding the story of climatic change in northern Australia. Um, for the Walmajari, this narrative is, is 
Um, it's more personal, it's much more immediate and it's much more challenging to Western scientific perspectives for the wall majority will tell you that the lakes dry out when people leave and that the water comes back when people come back. And there's an inversion of this ecological, symbiotic, human environment relationship there that I think we need to grapple with. Um, so Baraku is in, in many ways a key to understanding the story of human habitation in the Australian deserts. Um, and a core stone um, excavated by um, Jim Bowler, our, our other you know, significant geomorphologist, and, um, and the archaeologist Mike Smith, excavated in 2008, um, on one of these ancient shorelines has been dated at approximately 50,000 years. Um, this object was used to flake stone tools by a man sitting on the edge of the lake uh, 50,000 years ago, and its presence here indicates that Baraku is among the earliest desert locations for human habitation. Baraku is thus a place that elicits the interrelated boundaries of human and environmental history in Australia. But if we return to the, the satellite image I showed you in opening, there's another story being told here, and it's a story before science. The creation of Baraku occurred in what Walmajari people describe as the Walchery, often translated as the dream time, where two ancestral dogs, one black and one white, were chasing an emu from north of the lake. The white dog ran around one side of the lake, the black dog around the other. And you can see the shape of that story in the shape of the lake. After eating the emu in what would become the middle of the lake, the dogs left, travelling east where their mythic journey is today embodied in the form of an important and sacred creek, Bungupiti. Um, which is, this is the creek bed here, and, and that's um, the project team. Um, it, was in this, it was in the strata of this creek bank that the artefact was found, that 50-year-old artefact, and it was here that Walmajari elder Bessie Dunde uh, explained to us that those two dogs are like Adam and Eve. And it's this complex convergence of narratives that's being explored in the Baraku project. In August this year, Mandy Martin and her husband Guy Fitzharding led a team of artists and scientists, Swamajari custodians, photographers, an architect, even Bill Fox was somehow there, um, on a journey to explore the complex living legacy of the lake. It isn't possible to do justice to the, the breadth of the project in the few minutes that I have today, nor to the many collaborators, but two clear ambitions of the project are to create a book and an exhibition, um, which Bill has already mentioned, um, and the archive that goes with it, uh, around the themes that I'm sketching for you here. In these endeavours, the richness of Baraku is explored by placing the Aboriginal dreaming stories and the oral histories recorded during the project, uh, and placing them in juxtaposition to scientific interpretation and contemporary environmental issues. Furthermore, Mandy's artistic engagement, um, which I can't show you images of today because she hasn't finished her paintings, um, with Baraku as a painter will, will sit alongside Walmajari artist's own work. Um, and this dialogical orientation is already evident in uh, the collaborative artworks and prints being produced in the project um, by Walmajari and visiting artists. Um, as part of the management of their lands, Walmajari have also been producing hybrid maps with another artist, Kim Mahood. Uh, which fuse Western cartography with Aboriginal knowledge and modes of representation. In this instance, the familiar fields of intricate desert dotting quilt that knowledge of, of bush foods, seeds, grasses, fire-burning regimes um, over a topographic map of the same country. Um, in this image, Walmajari artists are again painting over a map of their country, uh, layering, perhaps you might say, effacing the cartographic perspective with the dreaming story for that site. And here the men are painting that ancestral story of the two dogs in the very creek bed created by the passage of those ancestral beings in the shade of the bank where that 50,000 year old artefact was found. And if you look closely, in the corner is actually Bill Fox perhaps having his first revelation about really deep time in the river. Um, <laughs> um, I won't talk much about these two images other than as, as a visual sign of what we're trying to do on the project. Here's an image of Jim Bowler, uh, one of our most eminent geomorphologists, on the, the ancient shoreline where that artefact was excavated. And on the right is a, a Walmajari, uh, a senior man who's painted that story and painted the story of today at the top of the painting using classic traditional Aboriginal iconography, showing the strata where the object was found 
and also the story of the two dogs running underneath it. In the palimpsest that is Baraku, in the, in the watermarked pages of its ancient geography, we can read the patterns of millennial droughts and floods, the passage of ancestral beings, the early traces of human habitation. In more recent times, as science and art converge around the lake, like those black and white dogs, Baraku is the frontier of a shared and still emerging understanding. Thank you. One of the most uh, remarkable experiences I've had was actually camping on the sides of one of these ancient lakes in Australia and watching the sunrise and sunset. And you could almost hear the water lapping on the shores of these 50,000 year old lakes. It's quite an experience. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce now Richard Black, who is, uh, Australian, is an Australian architect who teaches at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology University and with Michelle Black as a partner in Times Two Architects. He has co-authored three books on his teaching and research activities, which explore overlaps and adjacencies between architecture and landscape. His work along the Murray River, Australia's longest and most agricultural intensive water course, is sustained investigation into the impacts of floods on the river banks and towns of this remarkable river system. His proposed designs are based on sustainable solutions for the health of both the river and the residents. Black's drawings and maps from this project are the first architectural works to be archived in the Center for Art in the Environment archives. So welcome, Richard. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd really like to express my gratitude for the Nevada Museum of Art um, for the invitation um, to come and talk about my work. As, I, as Stephen mentioned, the project I'm going to explain to you is a 10-year project of, of um, trying to engage with a river system, the Murray River, which um, um, Gerald gave you an insight into the location of the Murray in one of his slides. Um, the river is about two and a half thousand kilometers long. And I spent the first five years of, of this project trying to really come to terms with that, that river system, um, coming obviously from a very different discipline background of architecture. Um, I guess at the heart of that project is really trying to arrive at a much more fundamental understanding of architecture's relationship to landscape. And perhaps also with some, some view in terms of looking towards a lot of the communities who reside along the floodplain. There is a slide before this image, um, which is quite an important slide, which um, a lot of the work I undertook in that first five years was to spend a lot of time in archives in state um, collections, um, particularly pictorial collections of looking at um, the flood histories of the Murray River, and um, particularly the 1956 flood, which was the, um, the largest recorded flood in um, recent history. And to really look at the way in which various communities, um, the impact between the communities and, and those that particular flood event, I think was a really significant um, insight for me into the relationship between the river and its ecology and, and those living amongst it. Now there were also another series of important parts of that way into the river of trying to think myself into, the, into this huge landscape. And one of those was to undertake a whole series of journeys across that five years along the length of the river from um, its upper reaches eventually, after about five years, arriving down as the, um, the estuary of the river when it meets the Southern Ocean. During a lot of those journeys, I undertook a series of, of works on the river, um, making drawings, undertaking walks, travelling along the river itself. And as you can see here, this is one of the um, 25 kilometre walks I made from shoreline to shoreline from the existing river to one of the edges of the 1956 flood line. And this, I guess, created a counter 
understanding of, of perhaps the absence of water and, and the reality of what the scale and expanse of the floodplain was like to experience on the ground and in real time. Some of the work that you can see um, on display up in the library, um, this um, mapping sequence is, is from the tail end of, of that five-year period where I reflected back upon the series of journeys that I'd made, a lot of the um, information and stories I'd collected from reading newspapers from 1956, which gave a, a very personal accounts of this huge mass of water unfolding over a series of months down this two and a half thousand kilometre stretch of river and its impact upon various communities. So the image sort of brings together three lines of time, if you like, of, of my personal encounter with the river, which are the photographs across the top, which are intersecting with some of the flood histories I've been encountering in the archives, with then these quotations of um, the devastation, perhaps, and also the impact upon the local communities, which are coming out of the newspaper accounts, and then perhaps a more traditional um, sense of a plan overview of the relationship between the river and its floodplain. So the red line depicts the, the actual extent of the one in 100 year flood and it also captures some of the towns that reside within that space. And um, there are about 15 um, sheets of these drawings which combine together to create this se sequence of different times of understanding this journey along the river. Um, in parallel to that, I also was invited to make an installation for the Melbourne Festival and, and I, I think thinking more towards the end outcome of some of this research was to think about creative ways of using water and particularly um, its ephemeral qualities. Um, and this was a, an installation made on the RMIT city campus a um, collection of artists, architects and landscape architects were asked to re-inhabit some of the laneways and my scheme flooded some of the lanes and um, created these series of water events through the um, two weeks of the festival. Really the, an important part of my understanding of the river and, and particularly the relationship of the, the cycles of, of no water and then these periods of flood um, have, have a very important ecological relationship which um, I think Gerald picked up on his discussion um, and the importance I think of this uncertainty of, of whether or not there's going to be any water and I, I suppose the Murray's caught between a battle between the irrigation communities which reside along the river and require water to grow um, food and then I guess the ecological requirements of the river which are um, for this connection of the river back to its floodplain. Now what has happened with irrigation infrastructure over the last 80 years is to sever the river from its floodplain. And I really like this quote um, which comes from Paul Sinclair's book who's a, a writer and um, historian who's wrote eloquently about the um, relationship of people and, and their relationship to the Murray but it really um, gave me a, a, a clear insight into how to act and how to think about design within this environment. And it was really about an idea of living with the river rather than against it, to take on the ecological um, requirements of what, how could we start to live perhaps in a more poetic way back with some of these ancient cycles. And this quote was a really beautiful, maybe um, reminder to me of, of these residents who would have a fairly nomadic relationship to two houses one down on the floodplain, filled, the house filled full of water and then during the wet season you go up into the drier parts of the landscape. So I took this on board and this was probably the key turning point of, of documentation, looking at the landscape and then thinking about what to do. And the next stage of that was to take students out along to some of these communities. We met quite a lot of the local residents. Um, this occurred over three years. I'd run design studios each semester. And this created another 
um, beautiful overlay into some of those early bits of research, meeting people, learning about their stories. And this was one particular town, um, Talangata, in the upper reaches of the Murray, which was relocated in the 50s because of the enlargement of one of the water storages. And um, it, it probably evoked for me a little bit of that sense of the previous quote of relocation and, and nomadic qualities of existence and inhabitation on the river and, and as, a, as a real um, useful idea about maybe design implications of how to live with the river rather than against it. So there was a constant sense of mobility and maybe a sense of maybe how to think about new types of building um, buildings which could start to coexist with water also new land uses that might coexist with when large floods came. And these were some of the things that were tested out in the student programs. The final phase of this research was for me to be almost become like one of the students. So I took on the design, a design project at the final phase, which by this stage we worked our way down through a series of towns and the final scheme, which is called Tidal Garden, which exists where the river enters the ocean. And I can't go into this in, in much detail. It's a huge project. It took about three to four years to work on. You can see here, I'm showing you a plan of the overall scheme. It um, involves the transformation of a grazing property, which the South Australian Federal Government purchased around about the time of starting the project. And their, their plans were to look for a visitor centre at the mouth of the Murray is a fair, because it's a fairly iconic site. So I took that on board and looked at a whole series of maybe ideas which that visitor centre could be. I designed a series of walks for ecotourism around which were in, inserted a series of experimental farms and new planting regimes to um, bring back some of the, the lost um, landscapes and landscape rehabilitation to help uh, recover some of the, the ecological um, systems that had, had started to die away from this particular part of the landscape. This drawing's really, it's a drawing over 130 years which is showing um, a collision of various shorelines that have moved and it's, this landscape is really mobile and the, I, I, I guess as a designer coming in, it's, it's really trying to work with that mobility and uncertainty of where land and water might be. And in, in one sense, uncertainty becomes a key part of designing in this environment. I'll just finish with one small part of this scheme, which is the terminus of one of the, the walks, which brings you out across one of those the shoreline that exists presently out into the estuary of the river. And it provides, in a way, an artificial, intensified understanding of some of the things going on within that larger landscape. It tries to work with uncertainty. It creates a series of terraces and terrains between the 1956 flood level and the lowest tides. So this sort of condensed small walkscape would be constantly changing over, over daily cycles of change. So it would give a one hour um, visitor to this particular location a sense of maybe what some of those bigger cycles and environmental systems that are taking place across the, the whole river system. And for me, this space was a little bit like the room in Echuca that had been in that quote of a, of a room in the river that was open and porous, a, a sort of elemental architectural enclosure of just a floor, columns and a roof, which would allow the environment, the, the river, the light, the weather, to permeate that space. Sitting next to it is a floating building which would rise with the tides and have a constantly shifting relationship to that space outside through this, very, through this window opening. So for me, the, the, the most important thing to come out of this 10-year um, project is, a, is an attitude to looking carefully at the environment. And it's only um, working within the environment, looking carefully, 
examining it over a period of time that we can then can make sensitive interventions within it. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, there was a very famous geomorphologist in the United States by the name of Luna Leopold, and his, his theme was a reverence for rivers, and I think you've illustrated that very nicely. Thank you very much. Our last speaker is John Reed, who has a humanities degree from Australian National University, a Master of Fine Arts from the University of New South Wales, and professional qualifications in graphic design. He joined the faculty of Canberra School of Arts in 1978, and now teaches both at the Fenner School of Environment and, and Society at ANU and the ANU School of Art. As a visual artist, he works with photography, performance, and collage to address human rights and environmental issues. Reed developed an award-winning School of Art Field Studies program and is founding coordinator of Environment Studio. His research also includes uh, software development for remote supervision of field research, procedures for artists, engagement with rural community management of natural resources. The Archives to Reach Fishman project resides right here at the Center for Art and Environment. John, please join us. Thank you, Stephen, and, um, and thank you to Bill and uh, Sarah and the museum for uh, the invitation to be here. Um, it's been fantastic. Thank you. Now, uh, this is Bill's brief to me. John, bring it all together in the Fishman narrative. Rivers, geomorphology, natural history, theatre, art, and then leap into public policy and the larger culture. Well, thanks, Bill. I'll do my best. <laughs> now, there are trees um, in Australia. And here's some of them. Uh, now, this is 1988, and I'm here in this landscape, the Bendora bushland, for the first time, on top of the coastal escarpment south of Sydney. I'm with a small group of artists from the School of Art at the Australian National University. Mark Boxall, Jenny Hillman and Fergus Armstrong. There are caves in the vicinity into which we are drawn. None of us stop to question our actions. The geomorphology. The caves are the interstices of an ancient limestone barrier reef that runs north-south from Janolan, the site of the famous caves near Sydney, through the Bendora bushland and beyond. the actual escarpment, uh, known geologically as the Nara Sandstone. And it is, in fact, an ancient beach. Huge seas pounded the permanent shore into fine particles that preserve, just as fine art does, vestiges of life. Back to the narrative. We emerged from the caves of, at, at Bendora with exposed film that, when processed, reveals a human-like figure submerged in the stream that flows through it. Another field foray a week later secures a, secures a second documentation um, of this creature, and it's in an above-ground watercourse. My doubts are dissipated. I realise how reassuring scepticism can be. We had photographed Fishman, a fine art discovery, not a scientific one. Two years later. This is Mark Boxall, one of the artists that were with me at the very first field trip in Bandura, swimming in an attempt to make contact with Fishman. <laughs> now, let me better introduce Mark Boxall, self-portrait with influenza, now, Boxall was by far the most eccentric f uh, photographer of the group. He never took a camera with him into these remote places. Instead, he would photograph his backyard when he got home. 
the artwork. Now I'm being spooked with the sequence of slides. Let's see. Now, here's, here, here is Mark Boxall again as he disappears underground. And the devastating thing is that he doesn't return. And this ends, effectively, the narrative. Now, here I am in, in Bendura at the height of the field engagement with Fishman, dancing with my constant companion, a camera on a tripod. I have, as a result, the artwork, a photographic folio of Fishman, its domain of wild rivers and forests, and an ethnographic account of how I coped with this extraordinary experience. Natural history theatre. Wild rivers excel as theatrical sets. Here I play the shaman pushing against the current to position myself for an encounter with Fishman. It's a self-portrait taken by a long cable release before I slipped under the current into a fissure in the granite riverbed. My training for this drama enhanced the performance of my lungs to fuel sensory awareness, to extend time beneath the surface, to summon the sublime. The theatrical script is crafted on the swim. A fraction closer to the centre of the earth, imagination can make things with the shadow of half-light, and it's possible to retrieve a semblance of a pre-cultural human condition, one unencumbered by the desire to process experiences of the world as a graphic symbol, dance and song. This wild state of being resides deep in our constitution, close to where we register the origin of our species. Immersed in an unsustaining medium without clothing or other artefact, with physical forces modifying the familiar fall of my flesh, with senses heightened by the prospect of being touched by the unknown, with the imagination forming monstrous aquatic beasts, fear takes hold, demons circle, and anxiety is rife. A perfect curtain raiser for meeting this human ghost. The Fishman, the only portrait that I have and that is known to exist, I retrieved this photograph from Boxall's files after he disappeared. The image speaks of the long-term action of water. So too does the earth. Sheltered in the toad's mouth, we could smell a wounded landscape. We went to investigate Monga Forest, a neighbouring precinct of Bendura. The conservation campaign, Monga Forest. There is a certain choreography associated with bringing forest operations to a halt. I made my stand in front of the bulldozer to stop it, to take the fish man into the magistrate's court, to play to the court journalists, to invoke in turn the mass media raise public awareness and provoke political action. The fish man, I told the magistrate, was at risk and so was our species. Bulldozers were sterilising the earth, places that are extremely biodiverse and perfect for teaching our children how to wonder. Bulldozers in ecologically stable forests should be stood before. the larger public. I've told the story of the fish man whenever the opportunity arises. The eloquence of its image lies in its human resemblance and journalists in the print and electronic media have been very responsive to the point of a collaborative engagement with me. The fish man of Southeast Australia fully manifest is a 50 minute narrative with 80 projected images delivered in a public lecture format and preceded by mass media promotion, often in concert with environmental conferences and symposia, and as part of a broad strategy of art production. Public policy. The impact of the Fishman narrative on public policy is difficult to determine. 
The narrative sustained public and media interest in several conservation campaigns when direct activist interventions began to fatigue. In the end, it was the regional community, informed by science, emotionally engaged and culturally supported by the fine arts, to whom campaign victories can be attributed. Monga Forest, the mother of the Mongalo River, and together with the Bendora bushland, were incorporated into a national park in 2002. <coughs> Walking the solar system. Recently, that's what I've been doing, and in terms of time, it's right now, and spatially, it's big, an upgrade on global. And when you walk the solar system, you realise how ultimately, ultimately dispassionate the universe is. It's up to us to ensure that our children will have a future that's worth living. Go ask the fish man. Thank you. That's an, that's an extraordinary project by John Reed to have conceived of a performance event and a series of, of photos uh, of the fish man to take that as the kind of last undiscovered hominid as an artistic discovery, put that before the press and pressure Australia into preserving some of the forest that is basically a remnant of Guantanamo land. It's an absolutely remarkable project. Steve Wells, thank you very much for, for uh, introducing everybody for us this morning. If we could bring the house lights up, I'd like to bring everybody up to the couch for about 10 minutes worth of questions from the audience because we're running into our lunch time. So if we could do that, if you would come join us on the couch. Guy Fitzharding, are, can, are, you, are you in the audience? Where's Guy? Who are you? Can you get, can you get down here to the couch? Come on, just I want I want to acknowledge the fact the importance that you have in this in these projects. So you're going to have to you have to squeeze in here on this one, I think. Guy Fitzharding, um, I mean I don't want to embarrass him too much, but he gets to the uh, he gets to the Stremel party last night, a little private dinner we had, and uh, he was acknowledged as uh, as Guy Martin instead of Guy Fitzharding. He is sometimes known as Mandy's husband, but he is also one of the leading conservationists. Um, uh, and, and environmental historians uh, in Australia. He raises such high-grade beef that it's prized by the Japanese who fly over to his ranch to Pennyroyal uh, and come look at the cattle and write magazine articles about him. It's the only uh, real property I've been on that's not only a working cattle ranch, uh, a pastoralist property, if you will, a grazier's property, uh, but also a nature reserve. So Guy, I just want to acknowledge the fact that uh, there you are out in these projects in the desert and you're working as an active conservationist. Uh, you're here to meet with the Nature Conservancy, for example, in town and then you go to Nebraska and be meeting with the Nature Conservancy people there. And so there's a wide variety now you have before you that gives you just a little deeper sense of what these projects are like. So it's science, art, conservation, anthropology, et cetera, huge projects. From the audience, a couple of questions about how art and science work together, about Australia, about... I, my question has to do, I guess, with sort of a cross-cultural understanding. In the United States, there's a very strongly held understanding of the idea of wilderness. And I think in a landscape like you've been describing that has a 15,000-year human history, can you talk some of you talk a little bit about sort of the distinction or a comparative understanding of the, these areas as being places that are decided to not wilderness in the sense that they've been peopled for 50,000 years. So Colin Robertson is asking about different definitions of wilderness in a place where it's been peopled for so long and some of the distinctions cross-culturally about that. If the red light's on, Mandy, it's on. On the bottom. Doesn't seem to be on. Oh, it is. Okay. I just um, quickly answer that, but I'd like Guy to answer that one too, because we've had this wilderness discussion quite a lot while we've been in the United States. But one of the reasons um, that we had so many people involved in the Desert Channels project was specifically for that reason. We wanted to put people back into the landscape because there's this tendency to look at landscapes as being pristine and not modified. 
And, um, you know, it's very important that we had all those different voices there. And CSIRO are used to, you know, sort of printing books with images of birds and trees. And, and they said, you know, they were absolutely shocked at having to print all these images that actually had people in them. And a lot of them were actually sort of children and family photos and family histories. So I'll let, let Guy answer the wilderness one. John. Yeah, thank you for that. It's a good question. Wilderness and pristine are two words that we try not to use in Australia because they're basically the language of exclusion. We're talking about a landscape that's been peopled for something like 50,000 years and yet in our cultural view, which is a European view, we tend to see it as an empty landscape and we actually need to see it as a landscape that's been modified, that's been you know, cared for and looked after you know, for you know, basically 50,000 years or more. So it's, so, it's, so it's part of the language that we try to avoid using. If I can just add to that, uh, the voice of a scientist perhaps, um, and, and it's that um, there was an enormous a change which took place in Australia when, when Europeans arrived. That wasn't an empty landscape and the, uh, the Simpson Desert that we see today as virtually a void in the Australian landscape was incredibly uh, well known to the Aboriginal people. And we know that because of one group of uh, Europeans that arrived on Cooper Creek, a stream you've heard mentioned several times. Uh, these were Lutheran missionaries. They came from Germany and one would have thought their main goal was to convert the natives to Christianity, but it turned out they seemed to be much more interested in the geography of the place than they were in converting the natives. And they produced an incredible uh, series of maps. And when you look at these maps, um, they're just covered with place names, covered with names that these uh, Lutherans acquired from the Aboriginal people of the Cooper Creek area, and which they documented. And if you go there today, it is an empty landscape. There's almost nobody there, one or two pastoralists and, and tourists who drive through it. Uh, but it's an extraordinary insight just to look at these maps and realise that people had uh, located um, objects and named objects all over this landscape long before Europeans arrived. And that almost died instantly with, of course, uh, disease and, um, uh, and the dislocation, really, of the Aboriginal people of that area. So uh, it's not a, a landscape that, that wasn't known and it's not a landscape that was isolated and it certainly wasn't empty. It didn't have a lot of people in it, but the people who lived there knew it incredibly well. And uh, an enormous, uh, there was an enormous loss of information in probably a period of 10 or 20 years. Yeah, thank you. And one final point too. One of the major aims of the projects that we've been doing is basically to put people back into the landscape again and to put people back into the landscape in our own thinking. Um, you know, the concept of co-evolution is very strong in Australia and yet, and yet the European cultural view has to be, um, you know, is, uh, basically seen it as an empty landscape which is, which is not the way that we need to go. Um, the term one final point is exclusive too, Guy. Uh, I do have uh, something that I'd like to add to the wilderness uh, debate. Um, uh, look, I can't help but agree. I mean, one uses the term wilderness uh, at your peril, certainly in art dialogues, because it does um, fail to acknowledge the fact that uh, uh, all the landscapes undoubtedly um, in Australia have been occupied um, and still are. Um, uh, there are a couple of ways of, of navigating this. Um, one is to adopt the view that is, has some currency um, in uh, UNESCO uh, terminology associated with um, natural heritage assessments. Um, and that is that uh, wilderness can, in, in co of course, include uh, the human being. And um, uh, so, in a sense, uh, a wilderness landscape in that context is one that is ecologically mature, it's stable, it's resilient, and human beings are a part of it. And their presence doesn't cause undue disruption to the ecosystems. Um, the other way around it is, and this is how I navigate it in, in my work, because it, it is a term that has currency. I mean, there are still wilderness areas listed on maps in Australia. And people do assume that uh, if you go to a, a wilderness area so designated, that you're likely to be um, uh, remote from the trappings of, um, of everyday civilised life. Um, 
I, I refer to that type of uh, experience as a wilderness experience. Um, and uh, it was sort of heightened in terms of my swimming to try and effect an encounter with the fish man when I was in this alien uh, medium, such as a wild river, uh, uh, absolutely devoid of, of artefact. And um, my definition of the wilderness experience is a full sensory experience of the world uh, unmediated by artefact. And it's still possible to have that and for that to have that sort of special um, significance in terms of the other sensory experiences uh, we have in our everyday life. We have four minutes left. Sarah's sitting here with her crook. Yes, Newton. Um, we struggle with this whole idea that the do do. Um, that is to say, finding a way of creating a common discourse about how one shares the, um, the resources of the world without uh, killing them, to put it bluntly. Um, and so I am interested, and we are interested in, in uh, if you sort of evolve the language or that, you, that, that you speak among yourselves. For instance, I agree with co-evolution. Uh, I mean, we use the word a lot. I'm not sure it's the same word. Uh, but I'd like to, you to talk more about the discourse you use in discussing these things. Quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> Three minutes. Um, Sorry? Repeat the question. So, uh, Newton's pointing out the difference that, for instance, in a word like coevolution might mean one thing here in America or to Newton and Helen might mean something else in Australia. And he's basically saying characterize the nature of the discourse that you use to talk about these things. Art. <laughs> um, I think. Three seconds. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that we're, we're any more um, advanced in terms of our language, in, in fact, I think that, that there's a, a, in every, everything that everyone's spoken about in this conference so far, I think there's this elucidation of this sort of paradox at the heart of our consciousness of being environed organisms within environments and our consciousness of that being a part within a whole and being responsible for the whole but also contextualised and created by it is, I think, really difficult for our brains to deal with and, and humans have forever developed ways of, of regulating their understanding and their engagement with their communities and with themselves within environments through art because we keep the limits of language, uh, certainly English and probably a great many languages when we get to that a paradox or when we get to that sense of being human within an environment and self-conscious of it. Um, and so I think just, you know, as an anthropologist, as someone who studies art from around the world, uh, rock art, indigenous art, and contemporary art, I see art as this regulatory language that we use to try and get ourselves past the limits of our, our thinking and our political systems and our history. I think we're going to have to... I think we're going to have to stop there. <laughs> Please, thank you.